quick time we'll begin with the sulfur cycle. Uh, sulfur is a very important nutrient and it's received increasing attention over the last several years. We'll talk about some of the reasons why that is and uh, how you know some of the nuances and particulars of managing sulfur. Um, here we're going to talk uh, with an overview, start with an overview of the sulfur cycle. So the primary form, sulfur is considered a macronutrient. The primary form of sulfur taken up by plants is SO4 minus uh, 2. So this is a sulfate, okay, it's sulfate ion. Um, the primary source for this is organic matter. Uh, also some precipitation, um, in particular for our soils, our region, organic matter precipitation. Okay, so again, thinking about kind of the relative abundance of the six macronutrients, again, NPK is often considered the, you know, the primary macros, and then calcium, magnesium, and sulfur, secondary macros. Um, uh, but sulfur really uh, occurs, excuse me, in equal quantities uh, as phosphorus and, and, and magnesium typically. Okay. So sulfur, uh, in terms of the concentration in the Earth's crust, it's about 0.05% is comparable to what we would find for phosphorus. Um, it's present in inorganic and both the inorganic and organic forms. Um, most of the sulfur, particularly true for soils uh, in Ohio and mid, in the Midwest, uh, most, the vast majority of sulfur exists in this organic form. Um, and then likewise, sulfur is similar to nitrogen in terms of cycling, okay? So we think of both nitrogen and sulfur in the context of it being uh, strongly associated with organic matter cycling, being strongly mediated and controlled by microbiology. And if you look at you know one of the soils, or really the soils textbook, the Brady and Wild textbook, they actually talk, deal with N, nitrogen, and sulfur in the same chapter because of the close association of these two nutrients. Typically, uh, sulfur ranges between 0.2 and 0.5% in plants, and of course this depends on the plant, the plant part, the stage that it was sampled, etc., etc. Grasses typically have less sulfur than legumes. Uh, legumes typically have less sulfur than brassica. So brassica, things like cabbage, uh, broccoli, um, cauliflower, etc., these are things that have a lot, you know, Often Brussels sprouts a small, a strong kind of sulfur odor when you cook them, or a strong distinctive uh, smell, and that's really the sulfur-containing compounds. Canola, broccoli, alfalfa are all very sulfur-demanding crops. Okay, so when growing those types of crops, we need to be especially um, cognizant of what our sulfur levels are and, and sulfur nutrition. Um, Sulfur is absorbed by plant roots almost exclusively as sulfate, SO4 minus, okay? Uh, trace amounts can also be absorbed through, um, at, uh, through gas. Um, and, but, you know, again, um, there's some interaction with leaves and mineral nutrition and uptake in general with plants, but on a, like a mass balance basis, the vast majority of nutrients are acquired from a plant the roots and sulfur is no no um, exception to that. There's also thiosulfate, this S2O3, um, and this is a uh, this is a pathway as well for uptake. Okay, so these are different ways that uh, sulfur uh, enters plants and plants acquire sulfur. So sulfur, uh, in terms of the function. It's an important constituent of a number of amino acids. Indeed, the vast majority of sulfur that occurs in plants are in the form of amino acids. So really, we think of sulfur, often we think of nitrogen and protein. Um, nitrogen has lots of roles and functions. Sulfur primarily is a constituent in amino acids. So it, it functions in the context of uh, protein first and, first and foremost, okay, protein formation. Um, thinking back to... Uh, High school biology, we talked about you know DNA and uh, these disulfide uh, bonds in terms of protein folding and 
these bonds are really important in terms of the structure of those proteins, okay? Um, we know that sulfur is important for promoting and fixation in legumes, so this nitrogen fixation by rhizobia, okay? Aids in seed production, and it's also important for chlorophyll synthesis, uh, photosynthesis. So, uh, again, here's um, sulfur concentration in terms of the leaf, and then we've got chlorophyll content and photosynthesis uh, rate um, on the respective uh, vertical axes. And so we can see that there's a strong relationship between um, the concentration of, of sulfur and between chlorophyll and photosynthesis. Okay. Um, like nitrate, sulfate primarily moves uh, to the roots via mass flow. So again, this is um, movement uh, with water. Um, greater than five part per million sulfate um, is typically in terms of the concentration of sulfur in solution it's going to meet pretty much all all plant requirements, and then most soils supply you know five to twenty ppm. That's a of course a, a just a ballpark figure, um, but you know this is a, a question in terms of most soils do it. Do all soils do it? Are there instances of deficiency? Well, of, of course there are, but you know we'll talk about those a little bit later on. Deficiency in sulfur um, is uh, <clears throat> similar to nitrogen in the context of reduced plant growth, stunted, thin, thin kind of stemmy plants. Um, like nitrogen, uh, when we fertilize with sulfur, if we have sulfur deficient plants, we have often have a, a, just a general uh, chlorosis, a yellowing of, of the plants. Um, and when we fertilize, uh, when there's plants are, are plenty sulfur uh, sufficient, then we've got a nice greening. And so sometimes when we apply sulfur as fertilizer, we can clearly see differences in terms of that plant greening up. Okay, so the plant actually becomes greener. Everyone thinks that that's all oh, the plants healthier. That's great, um, and that is often what we what we find, but you know, actually does it do anything different? Does it um, yield more? Is it, is it yield limiting? That's a, you know, that's a whole nother question. So sulfur is not easily translocated in the plant. So uh, unlike our, our nutrients that we've covered so far, N, P, and K, when we typically are finding, uh, we would look for deficiency in the older tissue for sulfur deficiency, we look for it in the newer tissue. So in this picture here, it's kind of classic striping that occurs as intervenal chlorosis in corn, and we would typically see that in the new, new, new leaves that are emerging rather than the uh, older leaves um, that are you know further below on the plant. Here's some other examples. Uh, sulfur deficiency in alfalfa. Okay, so we can see some kind of uh, generalized um, chlorosis that's occurring here, particularly on the leaf tip and all along this midrib. Sulfur deficiency in tomatoes. Again, here's this kind of classic striping that we get in corn. Um, and then there's a general lack of vigor. And, um, you know, sometimes the striping is present, uh, but certainly not, not all the time. Wheat. Um, it grows during periods uh, when, um, and you know, alfalfa as well, a lot of hay crops grow in periods when sulfur is, um, the soil is cooler, and because the mineralization potential of those cold soils is lower, we can often see sulfur deficiency there. And so here's an example of sulfur deficiency in wheat, okay? So these tri-state recommendations, um, state that most soils in Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio will adequately supply needed sulfur for plant growth. Sandy soils, uh, low in organic matter, or any you know soils that have a lack of organic matter may not be able to supply adequate sulfur. So 
Crops such as wheat and alfalfa that grow rapidly at cool temperatures when mineralization of sulfur is low or slow are likely to be more, the most likely to be acid deficient, okay? So again, these are kind of rules of thumbs, but acid sandy soils which are um, restrict microbial activity, low soil organic matter soils, cold dry soils, so delayed decomposition and maybe root restriction of, of ac acquiring sulfur in the subsoil, okay? Um, atmospheric sulfur deposition, uh, sulfate's deposited with rainfall um, both in dry and wet forms and we monitor that and I'll show you a little of that data in a second but um, it gets into the atmosphere through various for forms but it's exacerbated by the burning of fossil fuels so um, we know that deposition occurs in terms of an input of sulfur it can, it's very highly variable across the Midwest um, Legislation has decreased sulfur emissions in power plants and uh, subsequently sulfur has declined over the years. Okay, so let's dig into that a little bit more. There's this um, organization out there, National Atmospheric Deposition or NADP program, which is a national monitoring program. And essentially what happens is once a week, uh, a technician or somebody collects uh, rainfall um, samplers across the United States. There's actually three in Ohio. There's one in Worcester. <laughs> there's one in Delaware County, and then there's one in, in uh, West Central Ohio. They collect uh, this uh, rainfall and, and a bunch of uh, precipitation and, and weather data. Then they take and actually take a sample of that rainfall and they submit it to a uh, central lab in Illinois for analysis. And that happens on a, it's, you know, an expensive, or at least a, a very kind of large coordinated effort to do this. And it gives us very, very good data. And we can, we understand how much it rains and then the concentration. And again, it's, uh, you know, f the flux, which is the, the total deposition load is, the total precip times the concentration of the precip, and then you get the total amount that's that's fallen. Here's data. You know this has been happening at least in Worcester. It's been happening since the the early 70s. So we've got data, and you can go to this website, and you can it's you know there's a lot of good information here that we just don't have the time to to get into. But looking at different uh, nutrients and salts and ions that are getting deposited, um, you know across the landscape. So we look at what the sulfate ion concentration was in 2002, and we can see uh, there was a large, you know, high concentration kind of this eastern Midwest. And so why, you know, if we ask the question, well, why is that? What's going on? Well, the reality is there's a lot of industry. There's a lot of uh, coal-fired power plants that provide electricity along the Ohio River and other, other rivers. And because of that, there's been a lot of uh, deposition that occurs. There's, you know, Ohio, of course, is a very populated state compared to some of these other states. And so we've got a lot more cars driving and fossil fuel combustion and then deposition that occurs from that. It essentially travels up, um, you know, up, it follows the jet stream and, and travels typically up into the northeast part. But let's look what happened in just 10 years time from 2002 to 2012. This is an annual uh, average over an annual. So it's essentially 52 sampling time points that occur on a weekly basis. And they take and they extrapolate how much total sulfate deposition occurred. Um, and so here's the concentration. So this is an actual total, but these are concentrations. And we looked from 2002 to 2012, and you can see major, major reductions, particularly in Ohio and, and in the, uh, the Midwest. And that's because of uh, emission standards and cleaning up um, coal-fired power plants, having stricter emissions on sulfur content in gasoline. So that's a very highly regulated industry in terms of how much sulfur can be there. Um, because, of course, that coal or that that gasoline gets uh, gets combusted in the engine. Uh, this kind of SOX or sulfate um, uh, 
comes out and it's in, in a gaseous form and that goes in the atmosphere and gets carried and eventually deposited. Okay, so um, suffice it to say that, you know, this is an example of environmental regulations that have really reduced uh, sulfur concentration, sulfur deposition. And so this has been a source of concern. Oh, well, we're not getting the deposition rates that we once had. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe we actually need sulfur um, actually fertilize it for our for our crops. So, you know, that's a, an outstanding question, something that we've been looking into. I'll talk about that in, in another lecture. This is our uh, pounds per acre of sulfur deposition uh, from our, this Worcester station. It's this NATP uh, station 71. And we can see from the 90s to, you know, uh, close to present day, uh, we see a general decline that happens on an annual basis. So we used to get somewhere around 25 pounds annually, and now we're down to maybe 10, maybe, you know, less than half of that. So, um, it, you know, potentially has major consequences in terms of sulfur availability. Okay, so here's the sulfur cycle. Uh, again, la vast majority of this in microbial, uh, or in that organic fraction, inputs, include uh, fertilizer, rainfall, residues, etc. Their transformations, we have mineralization and immobilization similar to uh, the nitrogen cycle. We also have this absorbed to the um, anion exchange capacity and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. And losses include um, leaching and volatilization. Okay, so uh, we can compare this to the nitrogen cycle and it's uh, less complex, but it, you know, there's similarities in terms of the things that, um, the, the thing, you know, the, the mechanisms, the additions, the transformations, and the losses, there's parallels between the two. Um, here's a slide for, you know, for your reference, again, volatilization, there's no, like, denitrification or desulfurization, but there is a volatilization, and there is leaching as well, so, so again, there's parallels between those two. Okay, additions include uh, fertilizers, crop and animal residue, and atmospheric deposition. We've talked about um, most of those. Transformations can occur on the inorganic and in the organic fraction. Okay, so here we've got the inorganic absorbed to um, the AC and uh, the anion exchange capacity through adsorption, desorption processes, and then we've got this organic fraction of in mineral, uh, mineralization and immobilization. So the inorganic fraction uh, or the inorganic cycling and transformations is the, these uh, relies on these adsorption properties. Okay, so this is important, not so much with uh, soils that we have, you know, um, in Ohio, but on more highly weathered soils, one to one clays, alto soils, and, and oxisols. Uh, this can be an important source of sulfur nutrition and sulfur acquisition by plants. Okay, so highly weathered soils are one-to-one -one clays, soils with low pH, you know, acidic soils, um, even high organic matter soils can uh, have a lot of cycling that occurs through this um, uh, adsorption, from mineralization to adsorption, and then adsorption into the soil solution. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of interactions with the sulfate ion and iron oxide. So again, we can think of uh, iron and, and aluminum oxides. We talked about this with phosphorus and, and phosphorus being a, you know, um, a negative ion and the interactions that it has with oxide. Sulfur in the same capacity. Um, but uh, again, this is a small role in Ohio soils. In say, more tropical soils, we would see much greater level uh, or much greater interactions, um, significance in terms of the overall cycling. Um, like all things, in terms of rate of adsorption on the adsorption sites, uh, depends on what other anions are there competing for those sites. So um, phosphorus, sulfate, nitrate, chloride, you know, there's different affinities for each one of those. When we think about sulfur, particularly in an Ohio context, we think about it from the organic form. Six, you know, twelve. Uh, sorry, two hundred to six hundred pounds of total sulfur in the soil. 
in that plow layer, almost all of it's unavailable. Um, maybe, you know, these are, of, of course, rough, rough guesstimations or just approximations, but about three pounds of sulfur per acre are released for every 1% of organic matter on an annual basis, okay? So, um, you know, if you've got 3% organic matter soil, uh, maybe, you know, 9, 10 pounds of sulfur are coming out of that organic matter, okay? Um, soil sulfur is, is highly variable in the transformation. Because it's a biological process, it's a variable process, right? So we talked about nitrogen and carbon-nitrogen ratios and carbon and phosphorus ratios. We can also talk about carbon to sulfur or carbon to nitrogen to sulfur or even just nitrogen to sulfur ratios, okay? So organic matter has about 5% nitrogen and about 0.6% sulfur. So that means that our, you know, a typical well-drained Ohio soil, uh, an C to N to S ratio would be 20 uh, molecules of carbon for 10 molecules of nitrogen for 1.4 molecules of sulfur. Okay, so again, a general rule there for you. But the carbon to sulfur ratios are important in the same way that carbon nitrogen ratios and carbon to phosphorus ratios are important because they help drive mineralization and immobilization processes. And so less than two to one, uh, sorry, 200 to one, 200 carbons for one sulfur, we're typically going to see net sulfur mineralization. There's going to be more sulfur in that residue than the microbes need, so that sulfur is going to get released and made plant available. If it's less than 400 to one, uh, we're typically going to see net immobilization, and so there's going to be a kind of a sulfur limitation, and microbes will typically immobilize that, they'll embody that, and there will not be net release. And so somewhere in between, and this is a big range, but it's the reality, 200 to 400, uh, you know, there might be some mineralization or mobilization or no, no real net change that occurs. And then to put this in perspective, we can, it's a kind of a general rule, fresh crop residues, you know, we might think of them as like, you know, um, something that we're applying, 50 to 1 carbon to sulfur, okay? So that's, again, like nitrogen, that hasn't been, you know, that sulfur has yet to be leached out or volatilized, so it's a sulfur-rich product. A fresh residue is almost always going to contribute sulfur um, from a mineralization perspective because, you know, say 50 to 1, you've got to get up to uh, 200 to 1 to have, um, you know, to get into that range where there might not be any, any change, okay? So, um, oops, I do that wrong way. Sulfur uh, transformations. These are, you know, this should, these graphs should be looking awfully familiar by this time. Cumulative mineralization of sulfur. Um, it's uh, a product of um, sulfur content, so the concentration of sulfur in that, in that product, as well as temperature, as well as soil pH. It's a mineralization as a biological process, so the same things that influence mineralization of nitrogen are going to influence them, um, you know, either positively or negatively for sulfur. So temperature, moisture, pH, the types of plants, and of course the microflora that are there turning that over, all going to impact rates of, of mineralization. Okay. So then talking about uh, losses, crop removal, volatilization, and leaching um, as our three main sources of, of loss. So. We talked about this uh, already, but um, you know, movement to plant roots for crop uptake, primarily through mass flow. We can see for nitrogen, mass flow makes up 99%. For sulfur, they're saying 94%. Um, so the majority of that sulfur is moving through the plant roots as sulfate via mass flow. And then looking at crop removal rates of sulfur, so how much um, Sulfur, do you actually remove with you know a given crop? And say you know these are just really for field crops, and we can look at these values for other you know other types of crops, of course. But um, 
the total sulfur removed in terms of pounds per acre, depending on the, it's going to be a function of the yield. So a five ton hay crop of alfalfa is going to remove close to 30, you know, up to 30 pounds of sulfur per acre. That's a, a large amount of sulfur. Um, corn grain, uh, uh, this is really 180 bushel might not sound like a lot, but that's actually above the statewide average. Um, and that's only, you know, less than 10 pounds total. So um, we can see that it doesn't represent a, nearly the percentage of uh, of concentration that nitrogen or potassium would because these are relatively low numbers in terms of removal. So uh, we're typically not going to be pulling off any more than 30 pounds in a given year depending on any crop that we're growing unless it's you know exceptional or, or what have you but uh, somewhere between 10, 15, 10, uh, 5 pounds would be more typical in terms of removal rates. Uh, volatilization, so dimethyl disulfide um, is the primary way that sulfur is volatilized. Um, you know, we, this is just something to know, but we don't really do much to manage this. We talked a lot about minimizing volatilization for nitrogen. Um, we don't think and really prescribe as like an extension community a lot of ways to kind of minimize this. It's just part of an ecosystem turning nutrients over uh, loss and decay, and then there, there, you know, there are losses to the system. So, volatilization um, is relatively insignificant. It increases with increasing organic matter content. So, um, then finally, uh, we think about sulfur uh, leaching via sulfate, and this is a, you know, can be a much larger part of. Um, how much sulfur is lost out of that system in terms of sulfur cycle. So like nitrogen leaching, sulfur leaching is affected by drainage, um, rainfall, the soil texture, of course, um, sandier soils, um, coarser soils are going to leach more and, you know, if the absorption, um, how, what's that anion exchange capacity? Can it hold these sulfates in? Organic matter is going to have a part of that, of course. Uh, clay content is going to have a uh, part of that as well. So um, we don't, you know, again, like these are things that we have to understand our processes that happen in the soil, the sulfur volatilization, sulfur leaching. We don't do a lot from a management perspective to kind of de deter this or to try to manage for it because we typically don't think them of them as, particularly significant losses, okay, so, um, but it's important to understand that sulfur does leach and sulfur does volatilize, it's their pathways of loss and it's why, you know, we have to kind of be cognizant or keep, pay attention to sulfur and what's happening, okay, so, again, here's the sulfur, sulfur cycle, we've got additions, transformations, and losses, um, and again, it's similar to nitrogen, but less complex in a, in a number of ways.